Okay, uh, hello everybody. Welcome to uh, the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School, the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice. Uh, I'm John Hallway. I'm the Executive Director of the Center. I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I want to thank Andrew Margolis of Margolis Real Estate for sponsoring this event. Uh, but the person I really want to thank is my guest to my right here, uh, Professor Joanna Schwartz from UCLA Law, who, um, I, I, this is like such a fanboy moment for me. Um, uh, the, the work that you've done over decades um, has been stuff that we at the Quattrone Center have been following for quite a long time. And to have all the wonderful papers and things that you've written distilled into this wonderful book, which I'll put in front of the Zoom, uh, Shielded How the Police Became Untouchable. I think it's, a, it's an amazing um, work, and it's amazing to take all of the work that you've done and um, not only put it in one volume, but make it so easily understood and so um, piercingly clear in its logic. Um, it's really wonderful to have you here. Um, I have to do the obligatory uh, bio. I mean, if I'm going to fanboy, I'm going to fanboy. Um, so so uh, Joanna Schwartz is a professor of law at UCLA. Um, she graduated from some other schools that happen to be Ivy League schools that we don't really need to go into. But if you were interested there, Brown and Yale Law. Um, from there, she clerked at some lousy places like the Southern District of New York and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, spent some time doing civil rights litigation in New York before joining uh, UCLA Law. She literally has written the book on civil procedure. Uh, and not only does she write it, but she teaches it well, having won a distinguished teaching award from UCLA in 2015. Um, and so since then, she's been doing the research that she's going to talk to you about now, which is really groundbreaking and really, I think, reflects the interlocking structural systems that have evolved, you know, perhaps with some good intentions, almost always with some good intentions, but maybe some unintended negative consequences, and often leave, I think, my students and probably yours with sort of a collective, how can it be this way, uh, approach to police accountability. So um, she's also in the past 15 minutes, I think I've laughed more than in the past three weeks. So she's also just a really warm, delightful, funny human being. Um, and so thank you so much for being here. And I'm going to let uh, you talk about the book for a while. And then you all will have an opportunity to ask questions. If you fail in that obligation, I have questions that I will step in and ask. Uh, and we've got people on the Zoom. For those of you on the Zoom, we're going to try to monitor the Q&A. And we'll get to those questions if we can. Um, but it's really exciting, actually, post-COVID to see this packed room of people. So thanks to all of you for taking the time to come out. Um, please join me in welcoming Joanna Schwartz. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. I'd like to bring you along with me wherever I go to, to <laughs> offer those introductory words. Um, and thank you all for, for coming out uh, tonight. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to speak with you about my book, Shielded. Um, as John mentioned, this is a book that's the product of really a decade and a half of research and then advocacy before that time about civil rights litigation and really about how civil rights litigation functions on the ground. There's a lot of rhetoric within Supreme Court opinions, within commentary, public commentary, scholarly work about how civil rights litigation works. But uh, my goal really over the course of my research has been to understand and test whether those assertions about civil rights litigation actually pan out, actually bear relationship to reality. And uh, I think this is an important question at any time to be asking. I think it's especially important now and in these moments periodically when we are confronted with videos evidencing the uh, horrific overreach and violence that police can inflict. Uh, many of us have seen the video of Tyree Nichols being killed on a Memphis street and beyond that seeing uh, officers laughing and joking after uh, they inflicted the beating, taking photographs of Mr. Nichols propped up against a car, waiting minutes and minutes and minutes to provide any kind of aid to him. And in these kinds of moments, people ask for justice and also ask what justice might look like for these kinds of incidents of violence and overreach. And in our current system, we really only have three 
paths towards some manner of justice. Uh, criminal prosecutions of officers are one option. Uh, they are exceedingly rare. Officers are prosecuted in 2% or less of fatal shootings, con convicted in a third of those cases, and extremely unlikely to be criminally charged uh, for non-fatal force or other kinds of police misconduct. Another path is through police department's internal affairs, investigations, discipline, termination. These processes are really hampered for a variety of other reasons. As we were talking about before the, uh, the, this event has started, law enforcement officers' bills of rights often provide tremendous protections to officers, uh, allowing them to appeal and arbitrate any findings of discipline. And the findings of discipline themselves are rare. When the, when the Department of Justice has investigated police department's internal affairs investigations processes, they've found them to be very flawed with investigators not taking the basic steps that officers would take to solve crimes. So if criminal prosecutions are unlikely, internal affairs discipline is unlikely. The third path that we have towards some manner of justice is by filing a civil suit, seeking damages uh, against the officer or against the city that employs them, or seeking forward-looking relief, injunctive relief, that can address some of the policies and uh, practices in a department and the more systemic problems that lead to these incidents of misconduct. But what I aim to show in Shielded is that the Supreme Court and <coughs> state and local governments across the country have created so many barriers to relief for people seeking justice through civil rights lawsuits that the police are, as I say in the title of the book, all but untouchable. Now, it may be a little bit of hyperbole, they're not completely untouchable, and there are incidents of, uh, and, and incidents that you likely have heard of in the news of people getting multi-million dollar settlements, particularly after high profile events. What my book focuses on, though, are cases that you haven't heard of before, cases that haven't turned into viral videos and national conversations. And it is those cases where there is not a, a uh, spotlight on the event, where there is not political salience to the event, where the barriers that I talk about in this book really come to light and have their most dramatic power. These shields impact every stage of the litigation process. They make it difficult for people to find a lawyer. And that may be a surprise because to listen to um, the, the media or the general sort of consensus about lawyers in our society, there's way too many of them. And you would think that there would be lawyers filling the courthouses, happy to take cases uh, alleging even the smallest kinds of violations. But in fact, the way in which lawyers are paid in our society for taking civil rights cases is uh, that they recover something if their client wins, they recover nothing if they lose. It's very difficult to bring these cases and the legal barriers like qualified immunity, which we'll talk about in a second, proving a constitutional violation, uh, and many others mean that the risks of bringing these cases often outweigh their benefits. And outside of large cities, cities of the Great Migration, uh, where there are small but vibrant uh, civil rights practices, including led by people in this very room, uh, their, the ability to find an experienced civil rights lawyer it can be very difficult. If you find a lawyer, then you have to plead a plausible complaint. And although some people know exactly what happened to them, it can be very difficult to bring a claim with enough facts at the beginning of the case to establish a uh, complaint against a government where you have to show unconstitutional policies or practices by that agency. And it can be difficult, particularly when someone has lost a loved one, to know what the facts are that led to the the loss of that loved one. There is a chapter in my book where I talk about a woman named Vicki Timpa who learned that her son had died 
in Dallas Police Department custody, but didn't know how he died and got a number of different stories from people in the department. And the department had video and records that they would not turn over. So she filed a lawsuit naming Doe officers, John Doe officers, and saying that her son had died in their, in their custody. And then the Dallas, the city of Dallas moved to dismiss that case because she didn't have enough facts in her case to establish a plausible complaint, even though they possessed the records and the video that would give her the information that she needed. If you can get a lawyer, plead a plausible complaint, then you have to prove a constitutional violation. And the way that the Supreme Court has interpreted the Fourth Amendment, its protections against unreasonable searches and seizures, mean that people can be arrested, searched, assaulted, killed, having done nothing wrong. If a police officer believes and is objectively reasonable in the belief that they had cause to inflict those harms. Then comes qualified immunity. And that's a term that has gotten a lot of uh, circulation in recent years. But even if you can prove a constitutional violation, an officer is entitled to qualified immunity unless the officer has violated what's called clearly established law. And clearly established law has been recently interpreted by the Supreme Court to mean you have to find a prior court decision with nearly identical facts in order to overcome the defense. There's challenges in holding local governments responsible. You have to find proof of a policy or a custom or a practice by the department that led to the violation. And even if you get past all of those barriers and end up recovering a settlement or a judgment, the ways in which local governments budget for and pay settlements and judgments in police misconduct cases mean that they have limited financial impact on officers or departments. And many departments don't even learn from these suits, don't gather and analyze the information in those lawsuits, making it difficult to learn much of anything from them. These, this is the, the world of civil rights litigation and the challenges of bringing these cases. It's not that you can't ever get through those challenges. And there are wonderful attorneys, including attorneys in this room, who have done amazing work with the system that they've been given. But this system does not work as it should. And these limitations are justified by the Supreme Court and by state and local governments by myths about what the dangers would be of making it too easy to sue. If you read defenses of qualified immunity, for example, uh, it sounds as though if we got rid of qualified immunity, courthouses would overflow with frivolous lawsuits, officers would be bankrupted for split second mistakes made in good faith while on the job, no one would want to be a police officer under those circumstances, and our society would devolve into chaos. And really, when you read the Supreme Court's opinions, they talk about the importance of qualified immunity to society as a whole, in part because of this myth about the dangers of making it too easy to sue. And, and those myths are really what I have spent my career researching and finding that many of these claims really don't bear scrutiny. And to just take two of them quickly, the idea that officers are going to be bankrupted without qualified immunity overlooks the fact that states and local governments across the country have indemnification obligations as a matter of contract, as a matter of policy. They are obligated to provide legal counsel and pay settlements and judgments on behalf of their officers. And even when there is discretion not to indemnify, local governments often do. I looked at 81 jurisdictions across the country over a six-year period and found that 99.98% of the dollars came from insurers or taxpayers. 0.02% of the dollars came from officers in two departments 
The payouts in those two departments by those officers was an average of $4,000, not the makings of a bankruptcy petition. Uh, and the other part of that argument, that officers will be bankrupted for good faith mistakes made in a split second, ignores the protections of the Fourth Amendment, which already protect against reasonable mistakes. So qualified immunity's uh, structure and strength is based on claims that really don't hold, don't, don't stand up to scrutiny. I wrote this book to in the months after George Floyd was murdered because I was getting a lot of calls from legislators and journalists and, and other folks trying to understand how the system worked and what qualified immunity's role was to try to, as John kindly said, translate this information about these barriers and as well as my research to a broader audience to an audience that might not read law review articles for fun, although I can't understand why they wouldn't. Um, and also to understand, as John said, how these do different doctrines fit together. It's important to not just think about qualified immunity or the challenges of finding a lawyer or indemnification, but to understand how they all fit together and the way in which they interweave and the way in which they operate together to make it so difficult to find relief in these cases. Um, this book may sound like a bit of a downer. I'm uh, not going to lie, it's, it's a bit of a downer. Uh, if you can find a chipper, cheerful book about police misconduct, I would be really interested in reading it. Uh, but part of what I intend also to do at the end of the book is to offer concrete suggestions about changes that can be made to make this system work better. Supreme Court could change a lot of things, make a lot of things better in an instant, and so could Congress. I'm not putting much faith or hope in either body, but state and local governments have been and are continuing to consider and enact important changes. Uh, state laws ending qualified immunity functionally by creating state law causes of action to sue under the state constitution where qualified immunity is not a defense. Uh, and states are doing other important, and local governments doing other important work as well. I don't think that making it easier to sue is going to solve all of our problems with policing. I think that if we are thinking about creating a more just system, there's other important questions that we need to solve to ask and answer about what we authorize police to do. I think Philadelphia, I'll be really interested to see what happens with Philadelphia's uh, policy that ends traffic stops, minor traffic stops, and there's other interesting innovations that are being explored around the country. But until we have a working system, if we ever have a working system of criminal justice in our society, we are going to need to have back-end accountability when officers overstep their power. And my hope is, with some of these changes that I've suggested, that we could work toward a better system in that regard. And my great hope with this book is that we can, I can, you can, we all can, uh, bring these ideas to the people who can make decisions and make a difference um, and move some of these changes forward. Thank you. Um, so I know I said that you all would have a chance to ask questions, but I'm going to ask the first one anyway. Um, so, so can you break down a little bit more the qualified immunity, sort of the, the creation of it, right? What's its origin and the, um, the, what the real parameters are of finding a case with almost identical facts, right? I mean, one of the one of the questions that has never really made sense to me is I've had people say to me, look, if I'm a police officer um, and I got to make these decisions, I, I really don't want to be affected by worrying that I'm going to get sued. And we can go back and forth about whether or not that's what goes through an officer's mind in that moment. But let's take that for granted and say it seems plausible that police officers are more likely to be doing a job that could get them sued than I am or you are. Sure. Um, and 
it seems not unreasonable to provide some level of protection against that. But on the other hand, we've got a lot of students here who have taken torts, and they know that you can have a reasonable person standard, and you can have negligence or gross negligence or intentionality, and that those levels are things that we all can kind of evaluate and say, okay, if it's negligent, that's one thing. If it's grossly negligent, that's another thing. If it's actually intentional, that's yet another thing. That's not where we are with qualified immunity. Correct. Uh, so qualified immunity was first created by the Supreme Court in 1967, which was six years after the court first recognized that people could sue uh, government officials and law enforcement officers for violating the Constitution. And at the time, it was uh, an immunity that was sort of imported from Mississippi state law. And it was a good faith defense. It was a case in which uh, a group of black and white ministers were in the South um, and they, were, they went into a segregated bus terminals coffee shop and were arrested. And the law under which they were arrested was later found to be unconstitutional. And the officers were granted an immunity, a good faith immunity, because the officers thought that they were following the law. So it was treated really as a good faith defense. But then in 1982, the Supreme Court <coughs> wholly shifted what the standard was, no longer looking at an officer's good faith, but instead to whether the law was clearly established. And the goal in making that shift, said the Supreme Court, was that they wanted to make it easier to dismiss cases on qualified immunity. If you had to get into what an officer's intent was, then you might have to go to trial, you might have to depose the officer, and better to look at an objective standard uh, so that the case, a case that should be dismissed on qualified immunity grounds could be dismissed earlier. And then the definition of what clearly established law is has gotten more and more constrained over time, such that the uh, Supreme Court in recent years, the Roberts Court, uh, has repeatedly um, reversed denials of qualified immunity, talking about the importance of qualified immunity to society as a whole, and that what the standard is is not simply whether the use of force was objectively reasonable or not simply the standard or notion that you cannot use force against a person who is not resisting. That, the Supreme Court says, is at too high a level of generality. You have to find a case where their particular circumstances are so similar that every law enforcement officer, and every is the term that they use, would know that what they were doing was wrong or unconstitutional. So it is not, it, it is divorced from reasonableness. In fact, officers can act in bad faith so long as they have the good fortune to be doing something that hasn't been ruled unconstitutional before. And there's a lot not to like about that standard in my mind, but, but to just name one, Officers don't actually learn about the facts and holdings of these cases. You would think that the, the Supreme Court talks about notice being an important uh, underlying concept for qualified immunity. Officers need to be on notice that what they've done is unconstitutional. But officers aren't trained about the facts and holdings of these cases. They're trained about the broad concept, the concept that you cannot use force against a person who is not resisting. They are not trained about case X, Y, and Z, where someone wasn't resisting by lying down, and another person was not resisting by sitting up, and another person was not resisting. That is not how they learn about the scope of their authority. So tying qualified immunity to the absence or existence of a factually similar case, to my mind, seems truly divorced from negligence or, or really any state of mind requirement, and to the, the luck of the draw and the ability of the plaintiff's lawyer to be able to track down a case and then argue that it's sufficiently similar. 
It also removes any objective standard of behavior and replaces it with the subjective assessment of whoever the judge is as to whether or not you're close enough <laughs> well, to the other facts, right? That is true too. And, and research about uh, qualified immunity decisions has pointed out that different judges in different parts of the country make very different decisions about qualified immunity. And um, in uh, some interesting work uh, looking at appellate decisions on qualified immunity, you can see significant variation in uh, whether the president that appointed that judge was a Republican or a Democrat and where what circuit in the country that they are in as well. And there's differences across judges based on the political leanings of their appointee and the, uh, and the circuit in which they sit that is at least correlated to how often they grant qualified immunity and how often they find a constitutional violation. There's a lot of questions about qualified immunity, how clearly established the law has to be, which courts can clearly establish the law, that um, whether published and unpublished opinions both can clearly establish the law. These are questions the Supreme Court hasn't answered and circuits go different ways on these questions. And for those reasons as well, uh, there's great variation among the circuits in how they handle uh, these, these kinds of questions. And to be clear, the immunity means you cannot be sued in civil court. Right? For money damages. And so at least the good news is we get that decision quickly? <laughs> um, well, no. Um, I feel like that was a, plant, a nice plant of a question. I liked it. I liked it. Um, one of the other things to not like about qualified immunity is that when a qualified immunity motion is denied, the defendant has the right immediately to appeal that decision, which is unlike other kinds of decisions that are made by courts before trial. Usually there's what's called a final judgment rule. You have to wait until the end of the case because maybe the case will settle and you will not need to appeal any longer. It's decisions that you might think that you want to appeal in the moment at the end of the case don't matter so much. Well, that is not the rule for qualified immunity. You can appeal um, immediately uh, any denial. And that is because, again, of these justifications of the importance of qualified immunity to protect officers from the burdens and costs of litigation. But what it ends up meaning is that the costs and expense uh, of litigation can uh, expand greatly through these interlocutory appeals. I talk in the book about a really heartbreaking case of a young man who was shot by police um, in Texas. And I, I believe it was eight years that his case went up and down for the district court, the court of appeals, the Supreme Court, the court of appeals, Supreme, you know, back and forth and back and forth. Every court that had ruled on the merits of the case had concluded that his constitutional rights were violated. But it took eight years to exhaust all of those interlocutory appeals. And that's not just time. It can mean witnesses lose their recollection of what happened. It's money and time and money for the lawyers representing the clients. This is a family who needs to provide 24 hour care to their son because of this shooting. That's care that they needed to pay for on their own uh, until for eight years. Um, and, and so these costs are, are not just costs in time. Uh, they're really costs in, in the greater effort to seek justice in these cases. And so just one more and then I promise I will turn it over to the audience. Um, I was speaking to a, a federal court of appeals judge from a conservative district, and uh, he said a couple of things that, that I'm curious about your views on based on, on the book. He actually describes it now. He said with the new justices that have come on, he would call it the Thomas Court, not the Roberts Court. <laughs> um, but that Thomas actually has recently shown some signs. Thomas has written a number of the, of the key opinions defining both qualified immunity for police and absolute immunity for prosecutors in which he applies this very narrow standard. Um, but there seems to be some potential cause for hope that something that was judicially created might be judicially unwound. Does that, is that a, a sentiment with which you agree? And, and please discuss. So I am an optimist at heart. And uh, in 2017, Clarence Thomas wrote an opinion or concurrence in which he sort of said offhand that 
he thought that qualified immunity should be <coughs> reconsidered. And it was not that he was the first justice to say so. Justice Sotomayor has talked about qualified immunity allowing police to shoot first and think later. Clarence Thomas, who has been uh, very involved in articulating the qualified immunity standard to have him suggest that the doctrine should be reconsidered, um, got people's attention. It got my attention for sure. And his concern was not because of the harms of police misconduct and violence, but because uh, qualified immunity looked nothing like anything that existed in 1871 when we first had the right to sue and reflected what he called uh, freewheeling policy choices of the justices. That led a number of uh, advocates and academics, myself included, to start showering the Supreme Court with amicus briefs and cert petitions, asking them to take up qualified immunity and, re and reconsider, as Justice Thomas said that they should, uh, qualified immunity. And at the time George Floyd was murdered in May of 2020, the Supreme Court had somewhere around 10 or 12 of those petitions that it was sitting on. And those of us who were involved in that process, or at least I, thought that the court might actually do something, and particularly do something in that moment. They didn't. Uh, they ended up denying certain all of those cases. The conventional wisdom among folks I spoke to was they thought perhaps that the justices thought that Congress would take care of qualified immunity with the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which Congress did not do. Uh, but in November of 2020, the Supreme Court issued a per curiam decision, a short decision without a, without a named author in a case uh, involving really horrendous prison conditions uh, in a Texas facility where someone was kept in really heinous conditions for, for days and days. And the Supreme Court in that decision said, basically anybody should know, any officer should know that this person's constitutional rights were violated. We didn't need a prior case to tell them. That was an idea that had been articulated by the court um, a few decades before, but had been essentially ignored by the court. And here they were saying, saying this again. And the optimist in me thought, all right, well, here we go. This is a new uh, page for qualified immunity in the court. And, and there was one more decision where the Supreme Court reversed another prison condition case in Texas, citing that first case, Taylor versus Riojas. And then they really haven't done anything since then. And uh, so Justice Thomas is toying with me, I think, <laughs> is, is really what I take from that. I think that he, he and, and now that I have um, spent some time thinking about it and, and looking into it, he said a number of other doctrines should be reconsidered as well. And then, you know, lets people, you know, get agitated about that and then, and then nothing, nothing happens. So I don't have that much faith in the Supreme Court making any move on qualified immunity now. Not, not because I don't think they should, not because I don't think the data is on the side of them doing so. I think really that qualified immunity has become such a hot button issue and has come to represent so much in our public discourse that I think it's become difficult for the Supreme Court to act. I think that you know the Republican senators uh, viewed qualified immunity as a poison pill, as a, as a line they could not cross in negotiations. But there is important and interesting things, uh, work happening at the state level on qualified immunity by creating these state law causes of action that don't allow qualified immunity for a defense. And as I mentioned, I believe in Colorado in the summer of 2020, they enacted that kind of bill. And I think it'll be very interesting and very important to understand the effects of that bill. And if we can get data about uh, what is happening in Colorado, and I expect that courthouses are not being filled with frivolous lawsuits and officers are not being bankrupted for split second reasonable mistakes, and, and perhaps some of that evidence can also be marshaled um, toward a, a pullback of, of qualified immunity's uh, strongest powers, but but I believe it'll happen through the states. David. So 
Thanks. Thanks for the work you've done. Hey, David, let me just say one thing before you start. I think the mics are ambient, but can you make sure the green light is on your mic so that people on Zoom can hear? I think if you just talk, the green light will go on. Yeah, so <laughs> great that you're here. Thanks for the work that you've done over the years in critical studies and, uh, and the research. I, I want to kind of challenge something here. Um, uh, your book is about accountability. Um, and for all the reasons you just said, we know that police are not held accountable where they should be. A lot of people in the police department say lawyers aren't held accountable, right? Doctors aren't held accountable. That's, that's the nature of our system. We protect each other in our systems. But um, for, for, for sure, you know, it, it's too bad for police. And if you got rid of qualified immunity and you made it easier to sue, you just, you know, whether Congress did it or the Supreme Court did it uh, or states do it, uh, let's assume we're now in a world without qualified immunity. We're in a world where any plausible factual allegation will get you trial. We're in a world where the municipality is liable if the officer does something wrong. Like we do. So, so all these ways in which uh, you would have easier lawsuits, um, given the fact that officers never pay, um, sure, we'll get compensation for individuals in cases where they don't get it now, and, and that's, 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 that's a good thing, uh, where people get compensation for the homes they've done to them for eight years, right, is, is, is 24 hour care, they, that case gets money right away. But, how does that change police conduct? Yeah. Um, uh, in other words, this is the other side of the coin. Um, uh, criminal cases rarely do, right? Uh, very few. Internal affairs, uh, very good system. Officer Bill of Rights means that officers are rarely fired. And if they are fired, they're reinstated the back day of uh, arbitration. Um, how do we get accountability, even if we have a much fairer system for what I call constitutional tort liability? Right. So all your dreams, right? Okay. Right. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, it happens. Um, I think we still don't have accountability for the military departments unless they internally, right, uh, start agreeing with the kind of remedial measures you think they were to take in terms of training, discipline, and use of force, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so, so how does the system work that way? Right. I, I think that that's that's absolutely right, and it, I think that that. Making it easier to win in court by removing barriers like qualified immunity and vicarious liability for local governments um, does not automatically translate into deterrence uh, of officers or changing the ways of uh, police departments. Uh, it does mean that there are more cases where there could be those effects, but I think if you're going to make that aspect of the system work better, you do have to create some form of more effective deterrence than we have now. And when you think about, uh, or when I think about what that might look like, uh, I think of a couple of things. One is, I do believe that local governments should be paying settlements and judgments in these cases because uh, if it was left to the individual officer's bank account, many officers would not have the resources to satisfy settlements and judgments in these cases. But I also think there are ways uh, to create a sanction for officers, um, a financial sanction for officers, that doesn't undermine the compensatory goals. And one possibility is what this Colorado statute has done, which provides that Cities in Colorado will pay settlements and judgments on behalf of their officers, but if a local government concludes that their officer acted in bad faith, the officer can be required to pay up to $25,000 or 5% of a settlement or judgment, whichever is lower. And if the officer can't pay, then the local government pays. You may not agree with the precise mechanics of what Colorado worked out, and I, and I believe that during their negotiations, they were negotiating about whether there were carve outs, what the high number was, you know, and, and the like. But there's a um, logic, I think, uh, in the idea of creating a financial sanction for officers that is not putting the entirety of the settlement or judgment on the officer's back. Another option that, that some places have thought about and unions have proven thus far to be a real uh, barrier to this is having officers carry individual liability insurance. 
um, and, and Minneapolis uh, tried to get this on their local ballot, but the, the union uh, prevented it from doing so. And, and the idea was that the city paid for individual liability insurance for the officers, the base level. But that if officers were determined to be risks, liability risks, and their premiums went up, officers would have to pay that increase in premiums. This is another way of creating a financial sanction that I don't think undermines compensatory goals of litigation, but would create a financial sanction. As far as departments go, key to, to my mind is, it, well, there's, it's twofold. One is making sure that police departments gather and analyze information from these lawsuits. Um, and there are examples of outside auditors who have come in, looked at departments, looked at trends in those departments, found uh, things that should be changed, and then implemented those changes. And I wish that more cities required their departments to do that, and could, I think, as a condition of budgeting. Uh, if, in, if, if we're back to my magic, my magic wand and I could have everything I wanted, I would make injunctive relief much easier to get as well, um, in which case there could be demands for, for policy changes. I think that even with all of that, you still get to the hard questions of police culture, how to change a policing organization. But I do think that with those kinds of adjustments, uh, you may not change officers and departments' hearts and minds, but you might change their practices. Yes. Professor, thanks for being here. Um, I think, I think. You're on. Um, so you mentioned this a little bit in, in your um, initial talk, but I was wondering um, what you think about sort of the problems that many cities have faced with um, the number of police officers or people interested in going into the police force have, having decreased um, and sort of qualified immunity almost acting as like an incentive structure or sort of sort of recruiting method, um, and even if qualified immunity isn't, would it, like, even the police officers would still get those protections with, or some protection, just the idea of it and, you know, sort of what it represents. Um, if you could speak a little bit to how, without that sort of thing, um, you know, cities and localities might deal with that. Yeah, I do think one of the most frustrating things to me about the current debate around qualified immunity is that qualified immunity is described in terms that justifiably might make officers or people deciding whether to become officers <laughs> conclude that they don't want to be officers because they don't want to be bankrupted for split second decisions, even though that is not um, the role that qualified immunity actually plays. And I, and I think, you know, in my, in my dream, um, part of my goal and hope is that um, by shattering some of those myths, we can move past that line of argument. I also think there's been really interesting commentary in the other direction by law enforcement officials. USA Today has done a tremendous group of, of uh, editorials about, or opinion pieces about qualified immunity, some of whom uh, are written by law enforcement and former law enforcement. And the arguments that I've seen there are that Qualified immunity and the kinds of decisions that we read about in cases in which people's rights have been egregiously violated but they're denied relief are actually creating more problems with community police relations. And these officers in their, in their uh, writings also say, we, good officers, want bad officers to be punished and don't want a, a world in which the way we're encouraging officers to join the force is to say, you can do whatever you want and there will be no consequences for you. So I think uh, in a world in which qualified immunity was eliminated, at least an optimistic view, and as I've already said, I'm an optimist, uh, there would be more trust between communities and police uh, and, the pe and, and, and that would redound down to the benefit of of everybody. But I also take your point that the rhetoric around qualified immunity, if believed, might well frighten people away from serving on force. Uh, let's go here, and then we'll come back over here. OK. Um, 
if the light turns green while you're talking, it's working. Okay. So uh, recently, in the past few years, there have been a number of cities around the country that have started citizen police oversight missions. Most notably here in Philadelphia, we started one a couple of years ago. Uh, have you taken a look at them? And have they, have you noticed any improvement or any change or the possibility of any change through those, the enactment of those types of bodies? I personally haven't. But I, am, I have followed the work closely of a researcher named Sam Walker, who has spent many years of his career looking at these kinds of oversight boards. And there's a whole variety of, of outside oversight, civilian boards, outside auditors, um, and, and all sorts of things in between. And I think that he would say, and I believe him, uh, I trust his point of view, that they can be very valuable uh, and, and can do meaningful work. But the devil is in the details of how they are crafted, who makes up the committee, whether they have subpoena authority, what they, whether they have authority to require discipline or recommend how the reporting structure works with um, the law enforcement officials involved. So I think that the idea of some form of outside oversight uh, can be very valuable and has been valuable, but it really depends on the way in which that oversight is structured. I think one of the one of the potential challenges, and we have a, a former member of the the last iteration of the police advisory committee uh, here in Philadelphia in the audience. So, be you know, Angelica, maybe you want to chime in too. But um, you mentioned the Tyree Nichols situation where kind of unbelievably you have the officers after the fight joking and even taking a photo. Um, the Quattron Center was involved in a similar incident, incident of a death in custody with the, with the Tucson Police Department. This is all public information. Um, and there were a huge squad of, there was a fight for about six minutes with a, an individual. Um, and there was a, probably 15 officers in this alley that came in. And we were watching the video, and after that, a group of officers took the officers in, who had been in the fight off to one side while other officers were dealing with the individual who'd been in the fight. And that same sort of laughing and joking was going on. And as we were watching it, the community members saw uh, a, a number of officers who really had no regard at all for the value of a, of a Latino life. And the police said, well, we actually have brought in an extra squad of officers for two reasons. One is these officers who've been in the fight have, are filled with adrenaline, and the officers that are there are trying to find a way to comfort them and bring them out of that zone. And the other officers are there because we know the officers who've just been in the fight are in no condition to care for that individual that they've just been in this fight with, and we need to deal with that. So can you help us with the optics? Because we understand the optics are really, really bad, but what we're really trying to do is both take care of the officers and the individual who now is in our custody and care, and we haven't yet solved the optics problem. Now, I'm not saying that's what happened in Tyree Nichols, and I think the taking of the photo is pretty clear uh, that that's a different situation, but the ability of a community oversight group, to your question, sir, to have that conversation and understand what the police are trying to get to and see that world so that you can get to some, some better place, I think would be an important part of the advisory the, over, the civilian oversight um, communication. Professor Schwartz, thank you so much. Uh, this is incredible work. My question wanted to focus in, you had mentioned police union resistance to a lot of QI work. My background is a lot in police union resistance to change. And one of the things I wanted to ask was that, was there other public sector unions resisting qualified immunity change mm -hmm. along with police unions? And if that is the case, are there arguments to suggest, you know, qualified immunity for you, but not for police? This goes a lot in collective bargaining and arbitration, and this argument police unions make, like, we're just like every other government employee, so we should get everything just like they do. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are obviously distinctions, violence, things like that. And how has that played out um, in the day of It's interesting. The, I've been involved in a number of state legislative hearings, and my recollection is that the, uh, the representatives who against the bills have been uh, city attorneys, 
uh, our county attorneys and police union officials. In part, I think that may be because uh, many of these bills, or at least some of them, have only concerned ending qualified immunity for law enforcement officers. And it's an, actually an interesting story in Colorado. The initial uh, bill, which was, enact, which was proposed before George Floyd was murdered and got nowhere in the state legislature, uh, had as its intent to remove qualified immunity entirely. After George Floyd was murdered, the bill was reintroduced. There was a strong push to do something. But the negotiations ended up uh, only having the cause of action with no qualified immunity for law enforcement officers, for local law enforcement officers. And there was resistance by law enforcement union officials and other law enforcement officials saying we should be treated just like everyone else. But in fact, that was the intent really was for them to be treated like everyone else and for qualified immunity to be eliminated for these state claims for all public government officials. Um, but there was political, there was a, there was a political pressure to uh, at least get it done for police because police have been, police and qualified immunity um, have been so uh, conjoined in the conversation. Uh, so I, I think that right now, thus far, my sense is that the union opposition has been police union opposition, but that the, the legislation has also been focused on law enforcement. Thank you so much for coming here. I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on um, the wrongful conviction of Daryl Howard and how he was wrongfully convicted, served maybe, I believe it was 23 years in custody, and the jury awarded him $6 million, but the city of Durham voted not to pay out that award. So does, does that frighten you, that cities could just, once you get through all of these hurdles that you have now described, the city can simply vote to say, we're not going to pay this judgment? Yes, it does concern me. Uh, and it is, uh, it is something that, it, it's hard to know how often it happens. When I say that 99.98% of the dollars paid are from cities and counties, there are awards that are never paid because officers are not indemnified in some cases. And, and the reason that those, uh, the, those dollars are not paid is because plaintiffs and their attorneys conclude that there's no money to, to their $6 million was, was not recoverable from the officer. I think, I strongly believe that local governments should be vicariously liable, directly liable for constitutional violations by their officers. It's my view that we as a society give police and other government officials their authority. We give them police badges and guns and when they violate people's rights, we as a society should bear the costs of those harms. The alternative is, as in this case, the person bears the costs themselves. The costs don't go away. Someone has to bear them. And uh, there, are, there are other egregious examples and I, of a wrongful conviction in Cleveland that where, where there was a similar result. Ultimately, they negotiated a settlement. But uh, I, I think it's very troubling when there is clear proof of constitutional violation and beyond that harm over years and years and the city exercises its discretion not to indemnify. We have time for uh, maybe one question more if anybody's got one. Um, uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, we're talking about this law in Colorado that's you know, potentially a source for maybe some data to see how some of these changes works. Um, but it also, you know, that is going to require sort of gathering data and figuring out, you know, what metrics there are we can look at to see whether improvements are being made. So like, what would you look at to see whether a reform is actually being successful? Like, how do we measure whether something's even working or not? You're reading my mind because I'm thinking about that exact set of questions related to, to Colorado. I think one 
An easier set of questions to answer empirically are uh, how many lawsuits are actually being filed under these statutes. Uh, is what's the what does the increase in, in suits look like? What are the outcomes of these cases? Uh, what are the what are the payouts generally for different jurisdictions? Um, have insurance premiums changed for smaller jurisdictions? And simply to understand <clears throat> to simply understand the success rates of these cases. So the first thing that I would do is try to sort out how often these claims are, claims are being filed under this Colorado statute, how often they're successful, what the recoveries are, and how that compares to life before the statute was enacted, recognizing that, of course, you know, before June 2020, there was different political dynamics at play that might also affect those results. Then, if you try to, if you, if there, if there is some impact, um, I think that you would have to drill down on on Denver and a couple of other cities and do interviews and try to figure out what impact these suits are having. It's very difficult to measure, um, but some data is better than no data, and uh, at least at least it would be a start. Well, thank you for uh, being here. Thank you for answering these questions. Um, on the topic of jurisdictions not paying on some of the vicarious liability things, I think we're seeing that in the wrongful conviction realm. And in a number of cities that are looking at conviction integrity units and deciding that they're actually liability generators. Um, and so they're thinking about whether there's a systemic kind of no response, no in quotes, because you know it's easier than actually reforming. Um, but if you're interested in that topic, it is one that we will be discussing at the Quattron Center Symposium here on May 10th to 12th. So I'm going to use this to make a very elegant segue into plugging the next Quattron Center event. Um, but the really the real reason that people come to Quattron Center events is that we have such wonderful speakers. So I want to thank you, Professor Schwartz, for being here. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Professor Schwartz. Um, and the other reason that people come to Quattron Center events is to enjoy the society of their peers and profit from their views. So we'd like to invite all of you who are here to come downstairs and join us for a reception at which we can ask more questions and continue to benefit from your wisdom. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.